Hi everybody, Nathan here. Just wanted to share a very, very special announcement with you. We are turning 100. Yes, our 100th episode is coming. We're calling it the, the Back to the Frame Rate 100th episode spectacular. On January 10th, 2025, we are hosting a live event. It includes a film screening of one of the great sci-fi comedy classics, Galaxy Quest. And then it's gonna be followed with a live podcast recording of our show, myself, Sam B, and some special guests are going to be in attendance with a live studio audience. We want you to be there joining us at this event. It's a free event. It's going to be at the Weston Art and Innovation Center at 356 Boston Post Road in Weston, Mass. There's going to be free snacks, popcorn, candy, water. We want you to participate with us. Be part of this special, special episode. embers of human existence as the asteroid a behemoth the size of texas hurdles relentlessly toward earth the world braces for an apocalyptic end deep beneath the bunker a refuge plunges into the bowels of the earth here the chosen gather their purpose clear to preserve the very soul of our civilization the 35 and 70 millimeter prints that encapsulate the magic the emotion and the dreams of generations past these masterpieces each frame a testament to the human spirit are carefully catalogued and cradled in the cavernous confines of the bunker Perhaps there was room for more, for friends and family yearning for salvation, but sacrifices must be made. The moving earth stand united, the keepers of a flame, promising a future where the art of storytelling endures, transcending the boundaries of time and space. God help us all. Welcome to Back to the Frame Rate, part of the Western Media Podcast Network. Join us as we watch and discuss films on VOD and streaming platforms, deliberating on whether each one is worthy of salvation or destined for destruction in the face of the impending asteroid apocalypse. You can find more episodes of this podcast on backtotheframerate.com, where you can subscribe and share our show and find us on our socials at Back to the Frame Rate. I am Nathan Shore, and accompanying me, is the extraordinary movie mavens Brianna Butterworth and Sam Cole. Hello. Hello. Hey, hey. Hey, hey. <laughs> On today's episode, we are going to be discussing the 2015 Guillermo del Toro gothic horror romance, Crimson Peak, the third film in our gothic horror retrospective. Uh, pretty streamlined episode today. Busy day, busy week for us all. But this episode will be coming out just mere days before Halloween. So I suppose this is an opportunity to wish our listeners a happy Halloween. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to ask my co-host, I'm just kind of springing this on you, but what are some of your mm -hmm. Halloween traditions, whether they're movie or pop culture related or otherwise? Anything you guys mm -hmm. want to share? This is a good one. I don't know if I have traditions. I will watch Hocus Pocus every Halloween. That's a great time for me. But I have to tell you though, this, this is ridiculous. I do have a movie themed Halloween costume this year. Yeah. I will be Laura Dern and Tom will be Sam Neill and Maple will be in a stegosaurus onesie and together we will be Jurassic Park. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Sam. I so Woo! I honestly keep forgetting that it's Halloween because <laughs> I have I have so much so so much stuff beginning in November and in the next week I'm like oh that's right but I may be going to if it works out a uh, David Gilmour concert which could be epic not very not very Halloweenish but but I wow. if it, if it, if I don't have to work I might go to that but it I will <laughs> I have enjoyed the spooky season and I too watch Hocus Pocus whenever it shows up on TV. I love it when all the kids are at that house party at the beginning and they're like, we're going to go check on the haunted house. I'm like, I want to check on it too. I'm going to stick with you guys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Justice for Zachary. <laughs> well, I don't have much for traditions myself, although for our 
view people watching our podcast, not listening. I got my pumpkin and uh, I moved <laughs> my studio inside the house into my my creepy corner here with our uh, the eaves that. This, what you're seeing here is what happens on a lot of nights where the door just kind of opens on its own. Ooh. This is not, I did not set this up, but this is what just naturally happens when it's a windy night. That's crazy. So it just kind of like, cause it's, it's not sealed from the outside. Mm-hmm. There's no insulation. So yeah. That's kind of, that's kind of this spooky is, right there. This, this is, I'm watching a movie at night and right over there is, I'm in my family room. So this is my big TV is right over there. So mm. you can, this happens all the time. The, all of a sudden a ghost is going to come wandering into your room and be like, beware of Warwick cinemas. <laughs> <laughs> the seating is not great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. I'm looking forward to discussing Crimson Peak. This was Bee's pick for yeah. our, for this month. Um, B, why did you pick this movie? Because we went with gothic horror and <laughs> Del Toro is famously gothic and yes. slightly spooky. No, I, I think this is a great movie. I think it holds up. I really enjoy it. I think it's definitely falls in the top half for me of Del Toro's career. Okay. Now, you've seen this a bunch of times. Sam, you've never seen this? or I've never seen it? it. I saw it once last night at 2 a.m. <laughs> nice. A fresh review. All right. Very fresh, and yeah. I did see this one other time, probably a year or two after it came out on, on Netflix or wherever streaming service it was on at the time. So, yeah. But let's get it. We're going to get to this. I have a plot synopsis floating around here somewhere, and I will read that and then I'll play the trailer for it. After marrying the charming and seductive Sir Thomas Sharp, young Edith finds herself swept away to his romantic Gothic mansion in the English hills. After living there, also living there, is Lady Lucille, Thomas's alluring sister. I'm not alluring. Alluring sister and protector of her family's dark secrets. Able to communicate with the dead, Edith Edith tries to decipher the mystery behind the ghostly visions that haunt her new home. As she comes closer to the truth, Edith may learn that the true monsters are made of flesh and blood. Whoa. And play a little bit of the trailer from Crimson Peak. Ghosts are real. That much I know. I've seen them all my life. What you been by? Edith, this is my sister. I don't think she's the right choice. You have to trust me. Thomas, your bride is frozen. I run your hot bath. Well, there you have it. Wow. So Guillermo del Toro, this was his ninth movie at the time out of 12 films that he's he's made as of this recording. Transition from Pacific Rim. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) And uh, cast we have here. Mia Wasikowska as Edith Cushing, Jessica Chastain, Lucille Sharp, Tom Hiddleston, Thomas Sharp, Charlie Hunnam, Dr. Alan McMichael, Jim Beaver, Carter Cushing. Doug Jones does a lot of work in this. He's he's a famous like character actor and does a lot of these types of movies. He plays like the ghosts of Edith's mother and Lady Beatrice Sharp. So really good cast in this. Budget 55 million. Worldwide gross was 74.7 million. And this came out on October 16th, 2015. So yeah, let's get it. Oh, and be, one other thing, because I, I, I do kind of like to look at the box office and I'll do this really quickly. Like I said, October 16th, 2015. Anybody here know what the number one movie at the box office was that week? October 16th, 2015. That was the year that I went back to the, that was the time of the famous Hill Valley lightning storm. Sorry, 2015. Man, I really don't know this one. I don't think I know this one. I I didn't know this movie. I've never seen this. This is Goosebumps. Came out number one at 23.6 million. I never would have got that. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Number two in his third week of release was The Martian with 21.3 million. That's right. Mm -hmm. Number three, and it's also its debut week, was Bridge of Spies, 15.3 million. Love that movie. 
Crimson Peak was 13.1 million, came in at fourth in the box office its opening week. And number five Hotel in its fourth week, Hotel Transylvania 2, hey. 12.6 million in its fourth one. week. Let's get into the discussion of this film. Yeah. You know, a, a, a technical thing about it that I really like, and this is a weird thing to say, and this is like a total ridiculous first world problem, but bear with me for a second. So I have a, a television that is slightly too big for the space in my <laughs> living room. I'm exactly, it's, the width is 12. This is definitely a first world problem. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's, so it's, it's, I know exactly. It, re- it really is. It's, it's kind of pathetic, but. My TV's so, too big. My TV, so it's, but I'm the minimum distance from a 75 inch television and it's 9.5 feet. So it works. Interestingly enough, with modern films, and I don't know if it's the modern cinematography or the resolution, but Crimson Peak on this huge screen felt great. It was like perfect and immersive. When I watched Mm -hmm. Angel Heart last week, I don't know if it's the film or the emulsion or the graininess, but it was almost like headache inducing large. And I was like these close-ups, but for some reason, you'd think it would be the opposite where movies that have tons of like visual razzle dazzle and, and, and are packed with information, they are way more like relaxing on the brain. It's, it's uh, so, so Crimson Peak looks incredible on that side. You'd think that like Avatar would be too much, but it's perfect, but it's sometimes older films on too large a screen that that actually give me a, a just a slight headache from the distance. So I've noticed this multiple times. Crimson Peak was like perfect to watch last night. Like weird yeah. comment, but I don't know what it is. I think it has something to do with resolution or the way stuff is shot these days. But clearly these newer films are designed for these like high resolution televisions. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I wonder how long we've sure. been buying big TVs for, you know, TVs got bigger. I mean- they got big point. fast. I remember when it was like yeah. 2005 and a 50 inch was like, whoa, are you nuts? Yeah. You know, and now and it's we, like, then we oh. went through D and 3D and yeah. 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 Mm. So oh. ra- random comment, but it, it just like Crimson Peak, it was like a pleasure on the, it was a feast for the eyes watching that movie. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I do think this movie's beautiful. Yeah. I think it's really great to watch. It's beautiful to look at. Um, at the time, I think the effects were really out of this world. I think now, you know, you can tell they're from a few years ago, but I don't think it harms the movie in any real way because the set design is is so immersive. Uh, you know, it just it puts you right in that world right away. And the costuming is just everything just feels so textured. And, and this is something I love about Del Toro's work in general. Everything just feels lived in. It's really kind of visually appealing and, and there's lots of places to get lost in it. I love all the green, the, like the green lights. Yeah. Like there's a lot of green in this movie. And I know what you mean about the VFX. I found the ghosts terrifying when they were seen yeah. briefly, sometimes when they're like full on standing in a hallway for 30 seconds. I notice I'm like, okay, this is CGI, but it's still story wise effective that, I mean, I got some chills in this picture. Well, let's, let's talk about, let's take this to the top here. I like to talk a little bit about the, because I feel like this film is really a movie in two halves, or at least the first third is its own film mm-hmm. in a lot of ways. What are your thoughts about the beginning of this? Because the whole first half hour or more is in Buffalo and it's really not a ghost story or anything. It's a, it's a very different feel to the whole thing where we meet Edith, we meet her, her father and the, the main characters in this. I, I thought it was a really cool nod to Hammer Films with Peter Cushing having the family's name Cushing. So I think it's kind of a a wink to those those films, and mm-hmm. also kind of like sets the tone for you know we're going to be playing in that sandbox as well. We're we're making those homages to you know those those Hammer horror films, which is definitely a big influence on on this movie. Yeah, Cushing, known for those movies like playing Van Helsing and Victor mm-hmm. Frankenstein, and there's many more that took place in those horror gothic settings. So I thought that was a, a nice nod. 
I like the beginning a lot because I thought when first, you know, we see her as a child and she's in, in her bed and then the, the, you see the ghost's first appearance, which was terrifying, by the way. I thought that I, I was like excellent. The, yes. Um, I like that opening ghost encounter a lot. To me, it had the same feel and suspense in a good way of, of a Stephen King novel where you introduce this hook. Mm-hmm. And I loved the time we spent in Buffalo with the, with the characters where it was more like a almost not really, but like a, a Downton Abbey type, you, you know, yeah, vibe. Really, really. Um, but I really enjoyed that because I knew that the ghosts would be coming back later. And so it was like building an anticipation and it was time for some character development, which I really enjoyed. I love it when a movie tells you, that something creepy is going to happen later. So you take pleasure as an audience member of, oh, when's it going to be? And then when she's literally in her house and she doesn't want to at first go to the that formal like party, you just hear like a door banging and you're like, oh, it's someone knocking on the door because it's not set up at all. There's no like creepy shot indicating it. And then it cuts to the handle like waving by itself and the ghost is back. And that was like nightmarishly chilling to me. I was like, the ghost. <laughs> <laughs> and you know it's not just horror elements that it's drawing drawing from you know there's it's drawing a lot from little women and author and rebecca there's so many films and in, in elements from literature that it's pulling on from as well i mean the little women comparison is right in your face in the beginning the character of edith Very who closely resembles resembles joe yeah. from little women both are, are, you know, they're challenging gender roles, striving to be recognized as serious writers in a society that is imposing, you know, specific expectations on them. But I will say, and, and I will tip my hand a little bit here, I feel like a, that thread is abandoned, which I kind of would have liked if it played a role in her, her character arc a little bit more. It's not, is, I feel like it's not really what's defining Edith's character. It's not what aids her in her surviving the ordeal, like her her wit as being a writer. I mean, it kind of like bookends it a little bit, but I would have liked if it played a little bigger role in it. I can yeah. see that, yeah, because it yeah. was it's it's if it was infused more into her, like if even if there was more a scene towards the end where she's writing the best novel ever based on this. Mm horrific experience she had. I mean, it makes it so important in the beginning right. that it didn't, it seems to kind of drop that thread. Like I mentioned as, as well, Rebecca, 1940 film from Alfred Hitchcock, mm-hmm. you know, it shares so much of a theme about a woman who's marrying this man who settles into this estate and she's driven into madness by the memories of her husband's deceased first wife. And mm-hmm. there's all these references to uh, Jowl films. As well, the reds and the greens in the gloved hand that murders Edith's dad, House and Haunted Hill. Yeah, uh, I really there's yeah. all this coming I in. I think I think this movie is a really great marriage of highbrow lowbrow. And I think of this movie a lot as Jalo meets soap opera. <laughs> like this movie is so soapy to me, and I really like that. When we talk about such a long time spent with these characters, I think that's great character exploration. I don't want to say character development because I don't think, to what you alluded to, Nathan, I don't think all the characters develop over this film. I wouldn't say Mia's character has an arc. I don't know that that's a huge problem because there's so much other change being thrown at you in the movie that having her be the the staying power, you know, the the constant in the film doesn't really bother me the way that I thought it would. I also think it sets you up to know some of the characters so well that when there's a missing piece, it's very obvious because you've spent a lot of time with these people. So when we get introduced to the sister and suddenly there's a little bit of a mystery, you're, you're kind of like, perking your ears up at that. You're like, oh, something's different here. Here's someone who's a little bit off kilter. So it didn't, I hear what you're saying. It didn't sort of grate on me the way that I thought it would, but I do think she's very Joe March coded. Can we, you, you brought up the sister and she's introduced in the beginning of this movie. Can we talk about Jessica Chastain oh, in this movie and her God, performance? She steals and, the mm-hmm. show. Okay. So you're, you're, you, so you liked Jessica Chastain in this movie. She's oh, a net positive. Yes. In, in this. 
Sam, what did you think of Jessica Chastain in this movie? Uh, I, I thought she was, she's really good. I mean, it comes on incredibly strong that she's like obviously evil from like the first second that you see mm-hmm. her. But I thought she was terrifying, especially towards the end when she's unhinged and running around. It, 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 it was just like Del Toro is great with just like nightmare imagery or like mm-hmm. just just dread i mean if 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 edith is trying to get away and going down an elevator in the, into the mine shaft and you can hear like jessica chastain screaming and you're like oh my god she's she's going to come down a different exit she's found a passage like this is it's really unnerving so her performance is good i i, I will say when the when edith's father is murdered at the very beginning with that silhouette I, it was, I, rec, from the show, I'm like, I, I, it's clearly like Jessica Chastain. I was like, well, that's her. It's not Tom Hiddleston because I recognize her. I want to put profile. a pin yeah. in that for later, Sam. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Mm. Well, I, I, I'll be completely honest. I thought Jessica Chastain's performance was a major misfire for me. It felt overly tight. A trick. <laughs> and lacking so much depth. It, it gave me the impression that her only direction was to appear as, as though she was just having as little fun as possible throughout the film. I wanted her to have arc. And, and I felt like we knew everything about her character that there was to know about her from page one. And, oh, she's bad. And she stayed bad. And she was bad in the beginning, the middle, and the end. And Yeah, but did you know she no- was fucking her brother bad? But that played no consequence <laughs> on the movie at all. Oh, and, but her character itself, I, I just got, she just was here the whole time and just went from here to here. You know, people can't see what my hand is doing, but <laughs> I wanted a symphony to her character. And she was, I found her so one note and I, I like Jessica Chastain. I think she is maybe a top five working actress in Hollywood right now. But I found this to be one of my least interesting performances I've ever seen her in in a movie. Wow. No arc. No arc. She, she was just weird, mean, and evil from start to finish. But is that her performance or do you just not like the story? Oh, mm. It, yeah, I, I will blame the story, the writing and the direction as well. But I think it's also a choice. I mean, she is just brooding from start to finish. There could have been more. I, I, but that was my point. I felt like the direction was just have a miserable time. Look like you're angry and miserable the whole time. I think that there could have been more put into the performance that made would have led the audience to, mm, she's interesting, she's weird, but she's quirky. There was no quirkiness. She was just this level very straight line the whole movie is is my point but i i I hear you i i i I enjoyed her performance more than that but i also think the movie is is like that where it it's the characters are not subtle no they're not yeah it's a soap opera and there's another character that i also put that that same critique on and that is edith's father who i think is a good actor that was the performance from Jim Beaver, Carter Cushing, mm-hmm. who I, I think is a really good character. But the the dialogue, and I'm sorry if I'm hijacking this because I'm very passionate about this. The, there's a there's mm-hmm. the meeting between her, her dad and when we meet Tom Hiddleston, Thomas Sharp, and he's having that meeting with all the trustees or board members or whatever it is, and he pulls him aside, like, just stop your whole presentation. You know, I'm a, I'm a man who works with, you know, I, I, I work with, I, I, your hands are soft and the whole, and that, that whole speech that he gives and I don't, and I work my way up from nothing. You are come from money, that whole thing. And it's just so on the nose dialogue and he's everything. He's just, he's not giving me a very nuanced performance. And it's also the writing of it is very, so on the nose, everything that comes out of his mouth in, in this role. The one character, though, who I thought was had a very nuanced role and grows and has emotions and, th- and thinking things through is our main character, Mia Wasikowska, Edith Cushing. She's incredible in this movie. I think she is going with the flow and is riding this wave of ups and downs and is confused and is in danger and, and making decisions in this movie. I believed everything that, that she did in this movie. So, she generates a lot of 
empathy for her character with her performance. Like you really, yeah. you like her, you feel for her. And, and it, I didn't, I did not know what was going to happen. And, and spoiler, I was not sure if she was going to make it out alive. And at the end I was like rooting for her and I was terrified. And I was like, please, please get away from these people. Like this place is terrible. <laughs> I know, but she was great. Everybody else I felt yeah. like was a caricature of, or of, of somebody, but she was a living, breathing person that had stakes in this and everybody else was just kind of like thinly written caricature. But, hmm. I, I hear what you're saying. I feel like the, the, what helped with me is the movie is so beautiful to look at that, like that the visuals and the style of the movie, it was like, it was like cinematic candy or something like that. Mm -hmm. I was just like, Oh, this, this is great. And so yeah. I, I, I know I hear that about the character arts, but it was more like a, a I just, I know what you mean about that. To me, it just felt like more like a formal, they're oh, doing yeah. a period piece where Tom Hiddleston has dialogues. You know, I have feelings for you, but your father told me to, to, to break your heart, break but that's heart. not what I feel inside of my heart. And this is my motivation right now. And it's how I feel. So come with me to Crimson Peak so we can get the plot going for Christ's sake. Yeah. You know? No, it yeah. looks, it, this movie is scrumptious to look at. I, I have no complaints about that. The the reds and the greens, I've, it's, it's, it's like. Talking about all the movies that it's influenced by, it's not doing anything different character wise than those movies. It's like it's, that's it's, not. it's it's following in a proud tradition of horror movies, which are not really character driven, right? These are plot driven movies. So I think it's okay to let the external forces of the film affect the characters just sort of moving through the plot instead of their own internal mm -hmm. motivations. I hear that because because of that style and the formality of the movie, I I, I hear what both of you, what both of you guys are saying, I, I was more towards the positive towards the characters because it had that formal classical. Yes, some of the dialogue is very on the nose, but I thought they performed it well. There's no one in yeah. the movie that I thought said a line or did a performance where I was like, "Ooh, that is." Yeah, some, I didn't find like, anything yeah. wooden. I didn't. I didn't wince. You know. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't find anything too too wooden about it, but it might just be me. Well. We'll circle back around to that later, but let's, let's talk about the, you know, we, we talked a little bit about the, the look of this film and, and uh, I, like I said, I think the, there was something about the, the uh, cinematography of this, the, the reds and the greens. I noted there was a really, really cool line of dialogue spoken by Charlie Hunnam, who plays Alan McMichael, who is like mm -hmm. this. I, what is his profession again? I forget. Who knows? I think he's a, he's a, he's a op, optometrist because mm -hmm. he there's a great moment where Edith visits him and I I I'm trying to find I wrote this down here. Okay, here's what it is. So he Edith visits him. He says when he visits Dr. McMichael, his last patient was colorblind. He never perceived colors in red or green. Yeah. This entire movie is in red and green. And I had to make a note of this. Hence, mm -hmm. are we to perceive everything? You know, I was really trying to figure out what is Guillermo del Toro saying by this? Mm -hmm. Because here is, he's saying what this person cannot see, but yet we're seeing the opposite of that. We're seeing everything in high technicolor. And I just, I, I don't really know what we're trying to, take from that but i like that that's thrown in there i think there's a lot of eye imagery like we this father's skull is bashed in and it's around the orbital bone mm. and when tom hiddleston is stabbed at the end he stabbed yes. and his eye starts bleeding there's a lot Ooh, of yeah. emphasis on visual and this movie i later i want to talk about the poor reviews that this movie got but it did get critiqued for for a style over substance thing and i don't know i think this movie's saying more than people gave it credit for mm-hmm I will say on the on the on the style over substance thing. The the only thing when they go to Crimson Peak, the mansion, and it is so obviously the the Crimson Peak the location, place. the bad place. <laughs> I wish just that that place had come on just a little bit subtler at first, mm. and then the evil slowly seeped in because you walk in the door and you're like, oh, well, this is the this is the well, pinnacle well, of all. Well, no. evil, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't want to interrupt you. I, I felt like we walk in there. I felt a combination. I didn't feel evil right away. I felt like 
a sadness as well. Mm-hmm. It was awe inspiring and sad, but I felt like it was like a decaying, rotting, living place. Well, that's the I thing. Think- like it's 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 de- dark, decaying. There's literally it's. I mean, it's earth, but it's like it looks like blood is coming out of the floor. Uh, to me, that was just on the nose. Like this is the crimson peak they were talking about, and well, I wish it had crept yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> It wasn't um, like all of a sudden, oh, I'm at Crimson Peak. Like it was not, it was like, you know, we are going. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I don't love that this movie, you know, I, I'm okay with the lack of character arcs, but I, cause I think they're extremely well performed, but I will say this movie, my only real gripe with it is that it shows more than it tells more than it shows for the mystery. Right. So, you yeah. know, like Crimson Peak, I think, is revealed very quickly that it's Crimson Peak. You know, the sister is bad, bad lady very quickly. And then sort of Mia's character, she doesn't have to really figure out the mystery. She just has this surprise. Here's all the evidence that you need to know about this mystery. Here's everything you need handed to you. So she doesn't really have to figure it out. So as an audience member, we're just being sort of told what's happening which well, can be a little frustrating we're we're being told and shown a lot in this movie not only do we can we also conclude that the sisters e is evil but we're being shown all these snippets of dialogue and in, in conversations between tom hiddleston and jessica chastain where they're saying what are you gonna you know where mm-hmm. they're getting little pieces of their evil plot which is an interesting choice there's no surprises real major twists or surprises in this movie. We're just waiting for it to happen. And I thought that was a really odd choice that we're let in on this. We know who the bad people are in this movie already. And which is funny because at the other side of this, we're like, are they trying to also tell us that they're also trying to maybe make us question, are these ghosts evil? But then maybe they're trying to warn her and there's no real mystery about it it comes it becomes pretty obvious early on that these ghosts aren't really malevolent you know entities that they are they're giving her clues or trying to help her so i never it's it's a very bizarre movie it's not a horror movie in that in that manner it's not a i mean it's a ghost movie but it's not it doesn't fall into any bucket that you it will it I think I, I know like people talk about it. It's actually a romance, actually this, but I, I think it's, it's very firmly using horror conventions yeah. to tell the story that it wants to tell. If they had Is held it- off on the mystery and, and, and insert and did show a little bit more tell that yeah. that would have helped a lot. Cause that besides that, I really enjoyed the movie, but I was mm-hmm. aware of that, those mechanisms that were kind of like, here's the, here's a bad guy. And this place mm-hmm. is creepy. And like, yeah. it just was like right out front and center. There was one moment that I that did give me chills. I really loved how the plot unfolded. And it is when Edith discovers that she's being poisoned by the tea when she's listening to the phonograph. I thought that was that was Chef's Kiss, how that all played out. And I wish the movie did more of that type of stuff. You know, how how she was led to that and it got discovered. It's it that's the stuff that le- that makes the hair on my arms stand up, you know. I really loved Edith taking the key. And Lucille figuring mm-hmm. it out and how she got the key back and got all the information she needed mm-hmm. and not a lick of dialogue was spoken about it. I was like, I could have done with 10 more of those cat and mouse games because that was a treat. What else here? We, you know, we, we talked about the the house itself. Did we, did we talk about the, I want to talk about the plot. Yeah. The plot of the, the, the evil plot, because I didn't really understand at first what the what the plan was for Thomas and Lucille, why they were doing what they were doing, why. And it wasn't until I did a little bit more research this week, like where I had to look up some articles and what really were they trying to do? Cause I don't think it's that spelled out very clearly in the movie. And I, maybe it's just me cause I'm dense and I don't always get things handed out, handed to me on a silver platter sometimes. But was it clear to you what they were trying to do? Was it obvious that they were they're from a family that made their riches in clay and they had to, they were seeking funds from Edith's family in order to mine more clay in a failing business. And, but what was their 
Endgame. I, I, and they went around to all these other places to get money. I kind of got that, but the reason why she, he, so did he marry Edith just to get the money? But did he know that he was going to get paid off? Was his plan to get discovered that he was? I, I don't know. It just seems like such a contrived, convoluted plan to woo the daughter of a millionaire or, or whatever, a, a wealthy businessman. And this is what his plan is to go around to all different countries to do this. This is his plan to keep his family right intact. Like that just seems like the most contrived plan ever. <laughs> Upon upon one viewing, I was a little bit unclear as to that. I, I hear what you're saying. Like, I got the gist of it, but I wasn't quite exactly sure what he was trying to do. I was just kind of on going along the ride. I'm like, okay, he's invested in this. He's trying to make a machine that doesn't quite work. There's clay. Got it. Beyond that, I, I didn't quite I, – I understood surface-wise, but I didn't quite – I thought that he didn't want to be discovered. I thought the payoff was unintentional and like worked in his favor, but well, I'm not right. sure yet. That seemed like maybe just a happy accident, but he got to $30,000, which I think is around what he wanted to get in the first place. But that he didn't know he was going to get that money, but right. he was already trying, he was already courting Edith before that. Gentlemen, so it was a different time. Oh, I, <laughs> there's still good, there still has to be some good. You know what the reason is? No, I and, think- and, I, and I, I realized that this. I'm I'm really tearing apart a lot of the pieces of this movie, and I I wouldn't do this for probably a Hammer film or a Jalo film or things like that that has a really simplistic budget, poor acting, all that. But I'm holding this to a high standard because I like Guillermo del Toro. These have A-list actors and there's a big budget for this. And so I expect like they've thought these things through. That's why I have to look at these things. Cause, but yeah. So, so <laughs> my understanding is, which I like the man inventor aspect, right? Mm-hmm. My understanding is that they're, in a relationship, they need to keep that secret, right? They need, they have this forbidden love. They're trying to mine the family's money. They're out of it. They need more. They are wooing and killing these patriarchs to be able to get family fortunes. So they're just hijacking other people's family fortunes. And in order not to be discovered for the torrid love affair or the murders, they're doing it sort of around Europe so that they can escape. Right. And I no, that makes total sense. And I, I, I got that. I, I thought I confusingly thought I thought they were putting bodies like in the clay at one point, but I guess yeah. they, they weren't. Yeah, they are. They, they are. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Totally are. I don't know why. Maybe just as a place dis- to get rid of dissolve them. Dissolve it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Clay yeah. doesn't dissolve bodies. Well, just eventually the bodies dissolve themselves, you know, give it time. Right. It's just just, to, just to hide it as, as, it, yeah. as it, you know, erodes over time. And then becomes a spooky ooky ghost in the good movie. I, yeah, I guess I, I didn't have as much of a problem with that. I do, I do really think the, the set pieces and the props just give to this sort of sense of creepiness, gramophone, everything's dripping. Mm -hmm. This movie though, whatever problems you have with it up front, they got to pay off in like the last 15 minutes. I mean, the ending of this movie is insane. I loved the the oh. that fight was was really scary. and I, I did laugh out loud when when Jessica Stastain says twice she's I'm gonna I'm gonna fight you until one of us dies and then Edith hits her over the head with a shovel she's like, I heard you the first time I was like oh. ending was fine for me the yeah. ending is a fun bloody battle and Charlie Hunnam shows up again just yeah. in time it was amazing her falling on the snow I'm like oh my god is she yeah. every time I'm like is she gonna be okay I like it's it when, when he shows so up tension when he when Charlie I mean when when Tom Hiddleston shows up as a ghost and I couldn't help but think that that I know that Guillermo del Toro I don't, and I can't remember the reasons but he dropped out of the Hobbit and I'm of course a huge Peter Jackson mm-hmm. fan but I would have been fascinated to see Same. what 
what Guillermo del Termo del Toro's visuals of Middle Earth would look like because he's just that pan's labyrinth. It's just like the visuals. The visuals help so much with like story issues for me that I just like I said that this movie's like eating like gothic candy in the best mm. possible way <laughs> yeah there's mm-hmm. a lot about like this the final third of this movie that i'm just like always on the edge of my seat for the incest thing the first time i saw it totally i was like i knew it was leading up to it but i was like oh my god they actually went there and she found out what's and- interesting i th- actually was fooled by that because i thought the whole discovery was that they were they were married you know mm-hmm. i didn't i didn't know that was that's what of, i thought but- i thought the same thing yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, I I thought that was a great twist and a good catalyst for like why they're trying to get rid of these women. And, and I thought it served as good actual character development for Tom Hiddleston's character. Um, yeah, I and then that final battle, it's just so juicy and you get a couple bites at the apple there. It's just... It's fun and and throw the machine in there for good measure. Why not? <laughs> I and I didn't expect like everybody like the all the good guys to survive. Alan, the the doctor survives mm-hmm. this. He gets stabbed in the armpit. That I she winced at that. Yeah. I know. I was watching with Tom and he goes, "She really knows what she's doing." And I was, <laughs> and it was interesting. There was an interesting moment where after he stabbed the first time, stabbed in the armpit. And at the door, there's a, a moment where he asked Tom Hilston says, you know, where do you, where do I do it? And at that moment, I really thought he was going to kill him, but he was really saying, where do I stab you to make this like short and painless? That's what I mm-hmm. thought. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and, and I thought Alan was submitting knowing that like, this is the end. I might as well. And I thought where he stabbed him was the death blow. You know, that was, that was it for him. But I didn't realize that he, that they were that he turned at that point. And just so, kept going. Yeah. I know. <laughs> and, he, and he survived that. That was fun incredible. Ending. I think it's a fun ending. Yeah. I just, it's such a beautiful house. It's so sad to see the state it's in. <laughs> just snowing in the <laughs> I, foyer. I love that. You know, I know that the house is decaying, but that that's so beautiful how, you know, yeah. it depends on the season, whether leaves are falling in, by the way, there's no trees nearby, but it doesn't matter. Or snow is coming in. It's, you know, it's, I think it's one of the most incredible set pieces I, I've seen in the movie. And yeah, I, I love it. I love it. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. I have a great time with it. I wish it was a better movie in that set piece though. That's all. Okay. <laughs> Any other thoughts on this? We've aired it all out. There's Very probably what well we could say about it, but I think we, I know, I think where we all stand, I think we know where we all stand on this movie. Yeah. Oh, I think there was one other thing I was going to say. I love this moment there. Remember when Edith, it, not Edith, Lucille is playing the piano? Mm-hmm. Yes. Where is it? I have a note here. I did expect in the last, the last shot. I love how it's talking about how some ghosts linger and they're attached to an emotion okay. or a location, mm. and and she's playing the piano. I half expected her at the very final shot to turn right to the lens and be like, Bleh! you know what I mean? Like I was looking for that jump scare, yeah. but, but I love, I just, I like, I like it when movies analyze things and, and make it real. And so the movie makes you a believer in ghosts through story logic of like ghosts. Or like it has a, it has a perspective on ghosts and how they function and what they do. It's not just, oh, sometimes ghosts just creep around and and act freaky. Like any movie that introduces that story logic, even if it's like sci-fi or total fiction, when it makes that effort, it makes you believe in the possibility of it. And you're like, yes, you know, ghosts may be out there. And I, I like it when movies have that power. You know, Sam, if you haven't seen it, another Mia and Tom Hiddleston vehicle that came out, I think just before a couple of years before this, Only Lovers Left Alive, Ooh, uh, write that down. a, vam- a vampire film. movie by Jim Jarmusch, but the same thing where he's sort of um, imbuing his own lore into vampires. That's it's awesome. Cool. Stephen King actually said this. He really liked Crimson Peak. He said, I, I, when we were watching, I remember his, I remember his review from 2015. He made like a tweet where he was like, this scared the bejesus out of me or something like that. Yeah. Spooky movie. That was a good endorsement. <laughs> like, yeah. So I was going to say the reason why I brought up that scene with the piano is because it leads to a moment that they look over at the painting of mm-hmm. their mother, mm-hmm. which 
I found equally terrifying and hysterical. And I don't know about you, Sam, because you might appreciate this, but did you get any Vigo the Carpathian vibes from Ghostbusters 2 with that painting? I, I did, but there's, I, I, I totally got that. But there's also, there is a, a portrait of in, in my, that's in my, I don't know where it is now, but we used to have this portrait of like great, great grandmother in my grandmother's house. And it's got that severe, creepy look where the eyes follow you if you walk left or right. Yeah. Painting. And I saw that painting and I was just like, like it gave me the chills. I thought, I mean, I just, I, I felt like ghostly in that moment, but yeah. yeah. But it would have been yeah. funny if, if Vigo showed up and he'd be like, hey, I'm in I this movie. What I are think you doing shared, here? There's totally a shared universe going on here. It's totally. Yeah. This is a, and, and this is totally a shared universe with 80 years yeah. into the – or many years into the future. Like it's the Conjuring universe as well. Like the, all those ghosts, yeah. they're all going to be yeah. together, you know. Yeah. Good for them. All right. Cool. Well, I'll take a quick break and we'll come back with our thoughts on if this movie is going to be uh, – Saved or not? So, thanks give, everyone. Give it like three, three stars, maybe three and a half. We're yeah. gonna get to that in a moment, yeah. Sam. <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. How dare I? Oh, what are you gonna do? Cut my throat? Oh. <laughs> well, thanks everyone who has turned into our podcast, tuned into our podcast, I should say. If you're enjoying it, please hit the subscribe button to get new episodes in your feed every week. We don't have a budget for paid advertising, so we rely on you, our listeners, to help spread the word. The best way to support us is by sharing our podcast with friends or posting about it on social media. You can find us at backtotheframerate.com and follow us on Follow us at Back to the Frame Rate on Facebook, Instagram, Threads, TikTok, YouTube, and Twitter. And I think we're on LinkedIn as well. Lastly, we'd be incredibly grateful if you left us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. We thank you for your support. And you know what? That reminds me of something that I wanted to share. And I, and I apologize for the delay in this, but we do have a review. We love it when people send a, a five-star review our way on Apple Podcast. And we have one. I want to read it and share it with you. It is from Film Ronin on Apple Podcast. And I just want to share this because it's one of the best reviews I've seen here. Hmm. It says here, wow, what a great film podcast. Listen in for humorous and insightful observations by real filmmakers told in an easy to listen to conversational manner. I highly recommend this to cinephiles of all of all stripes. If you're new to the world, new to the world, wait, sorry. <laughs> if you're new to the world of cinema and film history, this is a great place to get educated and engaging take on some of the best films out there. So Aww, thank you to so Film nice. Ronin. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I love that. So you know what? Maybe if you leave us a rating review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, we'll read another one. So that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. So it is time for our de big decision, our vault decision on if Crimson Peak is going to be saved or purged. We don't have an order already decided here, but why don't we just give our, each of us give our final thoughts and our decision and, and our rating and our de final uh, decision on this. Uh, B, I see you chomping at the bit. Sure. Yeah. I really like this movie. I There are obvious flaws with it. Like I said, I think the mystery could unfold a little more elegantly, but that's okay with me because I think this is just, like Sam said, gothic candy, fun to eat, fun to watch. And I am I genuinely have moments where I'm scared every time. So for me, three and a half and today. And no, I don't think it needs to be in the vault, though. Sam, I'm going to send it over to you. So I know I, I definitely agree with B. I'm on the same page. I, I would originally say three stars, but I would give that extra half a star just because I I enjoyed the experience in spite of the flaws and the production design and the visuals are so great that it just was, I just had a pleasure watching it, especially since I had to watch it so late and that I wasn't sure like mm. what the, and I was like, oh, thank God, this is fun. Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I would give it three and a half stars. I too would, would not put it into the vault just because there's mm. more terrifying films out there. But I certainly like it a lot though. Mm. Okay. Well, for me, you know, I, I think this film begins with a line that says a lot. You know, ghosts are real 
sets the tone for a film that promises gothic horror and supernatural intrigue. However, it it visually embraces its gothic roots. There are a lot of themes and ideas that introduces that that are just half baked for me. The ghosts are set up as a key plot device, but they are offering little in terms of guiding Edith to uncover the truths. I feel the movie is, you know, revealing its, its villains early on through vague conversations rather than allowing Edith to piece the together, the mystery herself. I think that takes points off the performance performances. Like I said, are hit and miss Mia Wasikoska. I, I think is doing yeoman's work in this film. She's terrific, but everyone else is very ham fisted or heavy handed and giving a thin performance. Visually, like I said, this film is scrumptious. The color palette we talked about is incredible. I thought the special, I thought the special effects weren't bad. We didn't talk much about the CG in this, the ghosts. I thought some of it was kind of janky, but for the most part, it didn't bother me that much. I thought it was, I think it was a mix of CG and and real actors working. They they, they brought it together pretty well. The biggest sin, you know, it fails to commit to what it wants to be. And I think we didn't really talk too much about the reception of this which I don't think that it still knows what it wa- what it, what it wants to be. Is it a horror film? Is it a gothic romance? Is it a haunted house film? I believe it is possible to meld all these together in all these genres, but it's not it's kind of throwing all these against the wall and not following through on any of them. Mm. But to sum this up, it's, it's it's not a bad movie, but it's extremely derivative of all these other films in the haunted house, gothic romance genre, but it's lacking its own identity. And that's what my problem is. I wish I had, I was more positive on this film because I think it's well crafted in a lot of ways because, and I like del Toro as a director and I, and I want him to paint on large canvases like this, but this is not upper tier del Toro for me. So Mm. I'm giving this, I'm giving this, I'm still going to be generous. I think two and a half. I gave this on my other way. I keep score a five out of 10. So I'm giving this a two and a half hmm. out of five. It's and not in the vault for you. It is not, it's not <laughs> in the vault. Yeah. It is not the vault. The funny thing was, this is the second I watched this eight years ago and I looked at my letterbox rating back then I gave it a three and a half. So I was much more favorable on it the first time I watched it, hmm. but breaking it down now, I I'm finding a lot more of the things that, kind of drove me up a wall but mm. that's how i feel nathan where do you stand on two movies shape of water and nightmare alley i like shape of water a lot more than this and nightmare alley might be around the same level as this i really don't know how i feel about nightmare alley okay. i this i think it's kind of going for the same doesn't know what it wants to be again Okay. Yeah. But I love Pan's Labyrinth. I love the Hellboy movies. I love yeah. his early like Devil's Backbone and Kronos and but Kronos yeah. is so underrated. Mm. But yeah, it's been up and down. And 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 Pacific Rim. I, I, I love Kaiju. Any kaiju movie I'll sit before, but yeah. Mm. So uh. Eh. all right. So that that does it. Mm-hmm. Quick in and out episode this week, but we're going to be back later this week with our October wrap up. We're also going to hand out our awards for our Gothic Horror retrospective. I'm looking forward to that. So we I encourage everybody to tune in in a couple of days for that episode. That should be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, if you don't catch that, we wish everyone a happy Halloween. And we'll catch you next week where we'll be starting our next retrospective series. It's going to be 70s neo noir. Uh, it, it's kind of 70s neo noir, but I, I like to, bo- the, to niche it down hard. even further into hard 70s hard boiled detective noirs or something <laughs> like that. I know. Just- I, I, Mass appeal. It down anymore. <laughs> Mass appeal. That's what we're going for. Yeah, exactly. You know, but we got a, a wonderful lineup of films we're going to be doing. We're going to start off with what's the, what's the first one, Sam? It was the one that you Night picked. Moves. Night Moves from 1975 starring Gene Hackman. We got Clute from 71 with Donald Sutherland. 
We've got The Long Goodbye from Robert Altman with Elliot Gould. And and then we, we actually swapped it out <laughs> earlier today, I think. We are going to do The Yakuza, or Yakuza. I don't know how to exactly say it. With Robert We're Mitchum, on. I think from 1974, a movie I have not seen. I've only seen one of these, The Long Goodbye, a couple of times. So I'm looking forward. And I, I need to really learn to appreciate that more, I know. Because if anyone listened last week, it did not make my Altman top ten, and there's, oh. that's probably really wrong. So we, get, <laughs> we'll we, need, to, we need to we need to fix that. <laughs> so okay, that's it. Any last words? Nope. Nope. Okay, that's our show this week. Back to the frame rate is part of the Western Media Podcast Network. Special thanks to Brian Ellsworth for our show opening. On behalf of all of us, we bid you farewell from our fall shelter. Your presence in our underground sanctuary is truly appreciated. While you can't join us in the underground, we thank you for tuning in. If you're enjoying the show, please subscribe and leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite platform. For more episodes at Back to the Frame Rate, join us, find us on backtotheframerate.com and follow us on our social medias, at, on our socials at Back to the Frame Rate. Someday I can talk. Someday, <laughs> we'll see. Your support brightens our bunker. Until next time, stay with us, keep hope alive, and share our show with your friends. This is the end of our transmission. Back to the frame rate. Signing off. Adios. I want you to know it's over.